So moving on to our next slide, we're going to be covering quite a few topics today. The purpose really being to give you a fairly headline overview of the matters connected to COVID-19, which are crossing our desks at the moment, and so probably yours. In summary, we will be looking at um, the current closure of premises in Scotland, the impact of COVID-19 on property contracts and negotiations. Jane will then take us through the new legislative tenant protection measures, and we'll look at those from both a landlord and tenant perspective. She'll also look at some of the other financial support measures which have been introduced as a result of COVID-19. Claire will then look at the impact that COVID legislation has had on landlords' ability to recover rent, um, the changes made to legislation governing irritancy and termination of leases, and also whether there's any possibility of enforcing keep open clauses in the current climate. And then finally, Harriet will have a look at the effects of COVID-19 on the Scottish construction sector and on construction contracts. Now, obviously, it probably goes without saying that we're dealing with a pretty fast moving landscape at the moment. The regulations are being reviewed regularly. New issues are constantly arising. So please do just bear in mind that some of what we say today is likely to change over the coming weeks and months as things play out. So moving on to the next slide, when we talk about the impact of COVID-19 on real estate and construction sectors, most things tie back to closure of premises and the so-called lockdown rules. I'm only going to touch on the Scottish regulations today, these being the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Scotland Regulations 2020, which I'll just call the regulations from now on. The regulations only apply in Scotland. The position in England and Wales is similar, but not identical. So here we are only talking about closure of premises here in Scotland. The restrictions and requirements set out in the regulations are to be reviewed by the government at least every three weeks. So again, they'll be subject to change as we move through the various phases of lockdown. The regulations set out a list of various premises which are to close and businesses and services which are to cease during the emergency period. In terms of premises which must close under the regulations, these include things like cafes, restaurants, bars and pubs. There are only limited exceptions to the need for those types of premises to close, for example, providing food and drink for consumption off premises. In terms of the list of businesses and services which are to cease under the regulations, these include things which would largely fall under the umbrella of leisure premises, so things like cinemas, beauty salons, theatres, gyms, playgrounds, etc. The regulations also list various types of businesses which are able to remain open during the, the emergency period, but only provided that reasonable measures are taken to observe social distancing. We'll all largely be familiar with what those are now. They include things like food retailers, off licenses and news agents, pharmacies, homeware and hardware stores, banks and post offices and storage distribution facilities. All of those businesses can be forced to close under the regulations if they fail to adhere to social distancing measures. The regulations set out in broad terms for businesses what um, social distancing measures are expected of them and they include things like taking reasonable measures to ensure a two metre distance between persons on premises and those waiting to enter and also limiting numbers um, allowed entry to premises so as to allow people to adhere to social distancing measures. The regulations are supplemented by guidance from the Scottish Government and although the guidance doesn't have direct legal effect, it is a useful guide to interpreting the regulations and what, in broad terms, is expected of businesses. Premises, are not, sorry, premises which are not required to close by law are advised to do so in terms of the guidance um, unless certain strict criteria are met and those are pretty much essential health and welfare services and even then they are only permitted to open where social distancing can be maintained. Just as a final point on the regulations, they also include the so-called lockdown rules so that during the emergency period uh, none of us are able to leave the place that we are living in unless we have a reasonable excuse to do so um, and those are things that we all know all too well, such as obtaining basic necessities and exercise. So there are a lot of practical considerations for businesses to take away from the regulations and from the guidance. And um, for many, even if they are permitted to open, 
Can they run their businesses and open premises whilst adhering to the regulations and the requirements for social distancing? And also whilst meeting all of their other statutory and other obligations, for example, in relation to health and safety matters. Clearly also beyond social distancing considerations, every business, whether open or closed, is being impacted due to things such as reduced footfall, ongoing cost commitments, new costs for implementing social distancing and PPE measures, the list just goes on. One thing we also wanted to touch on very briefly today tied to lockdown and premises closure was just the position with registers of Scotland since the regulations came into force. For those of you who don't know, registers of Scotland is the government body which deals with registration of property deeds in Scotland. Now, obviously, your work as agents isn't usually directly connected to registers of Scotland. It's usually for us to deal with as solicitors. But that being said, um, the situation at registers post lockdown has impacted on timings for transactions um, completing. And so no doubt you might have heard about it. And without going into detail, um, we usually have to submit hard copy wet ink documents to registers. So things like dispositions transferring title to a property. Lockdown and closure of registers offices prevented that from happening. So the application record for taking on new deeds for registration was temporarily suspended. New, new legislation has now been passed, which enables registration to take place by submission of electronic scanned signed deeds um, to registers now. So that system started on the 27th of April, albeit they're currently working on a backlog um, of applications, um, but hopefully it won't be long before things are back to normal, enabling deep registrations and therefore completions that have stalled as a result um, to take place. So on a practical level, um, just bear in mind that this could impact on timings for transactions completing. If it already has and you've encountered delays, then hopefully that goes some way towards explaining why. So moving on to the next slide, um, it probably isn't surprising that in addition to the leasing matters, which Claire and Jane will come on to talk about, one of the main things we're having to think about as property lawyers at the moment is how to cater for COVID-19 contractually. A lot of the points I'll come on to mention will also be relevant to commercial discussions and negotiations that you might be involved in, and should also be considered at heads of terms stage um, at the moment as well. When I'm talking about contracts here, um, I'm talking about all types of contract, um, but in a property sense, it might be a contract to buy or sell a property or to enter into a lease. So touching first on existing contracts, so contracts which have been concluded and which are already contractually binding on parties. Most contracts concluded prior to lockdown measures coming into play will not specifically cater for COVID-19 or what happens where the parties to a contract are unable to perform their obligations because of COVID-19. So where there are some outstanding obligations to be performed under a contract, parties should be asking themselves, what are the obligations and which party has to perform them? Are there stated timescales within which obligations are to be carried out? And can those timescales be achieved? Are there contractual penalties or other repercussions if obligations are not performed on time? Now, if parties find themselves in a position where one or other is unable to meet their contractual obligations, then there are a few things parties might want to have a think about, which I'll just cover briefly just now. So firstly, on a commercial basis, are the parties able to agree to vary their contract? If so, they need to consider what the contract is to say now. So for example, if the concern is that obligations cannot be performed on time because of lockdown, do they want to vary the contract to include specific COVID-19 wording? For example, so the obligations only kick in once lockdown is over. We're seeing this being done quite a bit at the moment in terms of time dates of entry or obligations on parties to carry out works to properties. Um, tied to the end of lockdown. Now, if parties cannot reach commercial agreement and can't agree to vary the contract, then there are some other things for them to have a think about. You should remember that parties' interests might not always be aligned here um, and will likely be in or headed to dispute territory. 
one might want to force the other to perform, the other might simply just want out of the contract um, because they're now in a completely unforeseen environment. So here parties might want to have a look at uh, various things. So first of all, whether the contract specifically caters for the position the parties find themselves in and there are contractual remedies available to them which might help. Secondly, and alternatively, they might be looking to see whether there is a force majeure clause in the contract. And this is a clause which is in a lot of contracts um, of different kinds and which caters for unforeseeable and unavoidable circumstances which prevent a party from fulfilling their contractual obligations. The contract might, for example, provide that a party is permitted to delay performance of their obligations until the force majeure event ends, or it might provide for termination of the contract if performance has become impossible. However, parties would need to bear in mind that COVID-19 doesn't automatically qualify as a force majeure event. Every contract would be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis in the event of a dispute, and the wording of the contract and the circumstantial evidence surrounding non-performance would be key. And lastly, if the contract doesn't contain any such clauses which would help parties, then it might be possible for them to rely on the common law doctrine of frustration of contract to bring the contract obligations to an end as a result of the current unforeseen circumstances. However, again, that would be determined on a case-by-case -case basis, having regard to the terms of the contract, all factual circumstances, and also looking at legal precedent, so how cases in this field have been decided before. It's obviously important for all parties, regardless of whether we're talking about variation of contract or in the event of a dispute, um, to seek appropriate legal advice about what remedies are available to them. Now clearly, um, looking at new contracts, um, so contracts to be entered into and not yet binding on the parties, um, what we say here is also equally relevant to ongoing commercial discussions and also at heads of term stage. Um, it's useful to think um, throughout all of this, who is to perform what obligations and in what timescales. So you likely all have some of those considerations on your desks at the moment, but in broad terms, some things to think about might be all matters which lead to contractual timescales for performance and any termination events and long stop dates that are being included. For a purchase or a lease, what is the date of entry to be? For example, is it to be tied to the end of lockdown if the premises are of a type which can't be used just now? Or if the business run from the premises is of a type that can't operate under the current regulations? If there are works to be carried out to a property, when are the works to be done? Should works clauses be tied to the end of lockdown and the construction industry getting back up and running rather than to set specific timescales? When should rent free periods kick in for new leases? If they're going to be given to allow for tenant fit out works to be carried out, but the tenants can't practically fit out the properties yet, do parties need to consider how those are being structured? Given current and presumably ongoing tenant financial circumstances, should landlords be looking more to tenants to pay upfront rent deposits when they're taking entry to properties and um, to give some protection in the event of tenant non-payment. And obviously the things to think about will vary from transaction to transaction, but in practical terms, everyone should have those sorts of considerations at the forefront of their minds at the moment. So with all of that in mind, I'm now gonna pass over to Jane, who will have a look at COVID-19 and leases. Thanks, Christy. So to start off this section, I'll begin with discussing the various reliefs which have been allocated to tenants under commercial leases by the emergency coronavirus legislation passed by the UK and Scottish governments. I'll move on to the next slide um, to discuss the different acts passed. So the UK government passed emergency legislation to mitigate the impacts of coronavirus on our everyday and business lives and this was the Coronavirus Act 2020. This was passed by the UK government and became law on the 25th of March 2020. And this was quickly followed by the Coronavirus Scotland Act 2020, which was to complement measures already implemented by the UK wide act. Now, there are various areas covered by the legislation, 
but for the purposes of this part of the presentation, those which are immediately relevant to commercial leases are the protection from termination for commercial tenants, land registration, which Kirsty has already mentioned, so I won't go into this area again, planning and various financial support measures to support businesses in the wake of the pandemic. You'll note on this slide, I've also referred to the anticipated timescales associated with legislation being a two year timescale for the UK wide act. And in Scotland, this is until the 30th of September of this year. The Scottish ministers can extend for two further periods of six months, meaning the legislation may be in place for a total of 18 months. So moving on to the next slide to take the reliefs I've mentioned in turn. The first is the protection from termination for commercial tenants. I've mentioned this one first, as it's arguably one of the most powerful provisions under the coronavirus act. However, given this is more of a property litigation topic than pure real estate, I'll leave our expert Claire to talk about this in more depth shortly. So at the bottom of this slide, I've referred to the protections that have been acted in respect of planning. Most notably, these are changes to planning timescales, which I'll try and summarise as briefly as I can. So where full planning permission or planning permission in principle would expire, then that permission should not lapse for a period of 12 months from the date on which the Act came into force. And this applies even if the development is not commenced, and the permission would only lapse if the development has not commenced before the end of the 12-month period. These time sales, again, can be amended by Scottish ministers if required. The legislation also provides the ability to defer an application for approval to the end of the 12-month period, provided the application is made within the six-month emergency period. There are also relaxations on planning by both governments, the UK and Scottish government, to protect pubs, restaurants and cafes against planning enforcement action where they've converted their businesses to become takeaway outlets during the outbreak. The relaxation applies in England for one year, and so far in Scotland, this is up until the end of June 2020, but again, this may be reviewed. So moving on to the next slide, the next area of protection for tenants that I'll mention are the financial support measures, which have been put in place by the UK and Scottish governments. And on each slide, I have outlined where the position differs between Scotland and the rest of the UK. So the first measure, which is set out on this slide, is the Retail and Hospitality Grant Scheme. And this is to provide businesses which have properties with a rateable value of less than £51,000, the opportunity to receive grants. And the amount of grant offered depends on the value of the property in question. And there are differences also between the offering in Scotland and the rest of the UK. In England and Wales, it's up to £25,000 per property. And in Scotland, it is up to £25,000 for the first property, and then up to £18,750 for each additional property thereafter. It's important to note also, as I've said at the bottom of the slide, that a £10,000 grant is also available to certain small businesses out with the retail, leisure and hospitality sectors. And this is the same position throughout the UK. So moving on to the next slide, another financial relief measure, which you'll have no doubt become aware of, is the business rates relief. Across both jurisdictions, premises in the retail, leisure and hospitality sectors will automatically qualify for 100% rates relief for the 2020-21 tax year. It's important to note that in order to qualify for the relief, the premises in question must be occupied. Although temporary closure to deal with COVID-19 does not prevent a property from being treated as occupied for the purposes of the relief. For premises not in the retail, leisure and hospitality sectors, the position differs between Scotland and the rest of the UK. In Scotland, the 1.6% 1 rates increase for other non-domestic properties, which was due to take effect this year, is to be reversed. However, in the rest of the UK, there's not been any specific provision made for these types of properties in terms of rates relief. 
So now moving on to the next slide, the next financial relief to mention is the Coronavirus Business Interruption Loan Scheme, which is again a nice catchy name. This is a UK wide scheme offered by 40 accredited lenders and it's backed by the government owned British Business Bank. It offers support to UK businesses with a turnover of up to £45 million, with access to finance up to £5 million for up to six years. The government's also recently revamped the scheme to make it easier for businesses to access funding, and it's announced two further related schemes. The first is the Coronavirus Large Business Interruption Loan Scheme. As the name suggests, this is for larger businesses with a turnover of over £45 million, providing access to government-backed loans of up to £50 million. This depends on the company in question's turnover. And the second is the Bounce Back Loan Scheme, which is for smaller businesses, and it provides access to fast-track government-backed loans of up to £50,000. So going on to the next slide, the final financial relief to mention is VAT deferral. In terms of this relief, all VAT registered UK businesses will not have to pay the VAT normally due with their VAT returns for the period between the 20th of March and the 30th of June 2020. Businesses have been given until the end of the 2020-21 tax year to pay any amounts due which have accumulated during the deferral period. In the meantime, VAT refunds and reclaims will be paid by the government as normal. And as I've noted on this slide, the position on this is the same throughout the UK. So moving on to the next slide and away from the areas of protection for tenants that have been legislated for. A large number of tenants are taking matters into their own hands and approaching their landlords with proposals for sharing the rental risk and reaching voluntary arrangements about rental payments due imminently. For example, as I've noted on the slide, tenants have been requesting rent holidays, reductions in rent or re of their lease terms to take the pandemic into account. Now, although these kinds of requests have been numerous, under most leases, there won't be an obligation on the landlord to agree to that request. However, it is always important to check the terms of the lease to ensure this is the case, as of course the terms of every lease are different. It's also important to consider in terms of new leases, we're facing an ever-changing landscape in the wake of the pandemic. So it's fair to say that tenants are being more alert to these sorts of issues at the moment and may negotiate these sorts of clauses before entering into a lease now. In any event, although there may be no obligation on the landlord to agree to a request like this, at the moment it may be in some landlord's interest to come to some kind of accommodation with tenants in terms of a reputational and commercial standpoint. So if a landlord is minded to grant a concession, it cannot be stressed enough that this should be recorded in writing, as we lawyers always say. This could be done by way of a side letter or side agreement, which many lawyers are now likely quite well versed in doing as a result of the pandemic. But a number of points should be considered in terms of recording any agreement between the parties which, if they aren't, can cause problems down the line. I've noted a few of these on the slide for reference, including the question of interest, whether the concession is personal to the tenant, early repayment if the tenant tries to assign the lease, what happens on insolvency, can it be revoked if other breaches of the lease occur, will there be a requirement for a disregard at review, and Lastly, has the tenant taken advantage of any government assistance as a result of the COVID outbreak? If so, this should be declared to the landlord with potentially a reimbursement to be made where relevant. So having focused on the position for tenants in the wake of the coronavirus outbreak, I'll move on to the next slide to just discuss a little how things are looking for landlords at the moment. As I've said, there are various protections for tenants set out in law under the emergency legislation. But at the moment, there's little in the way of provision made for landlords. Although, as Kirsty mentioned at the start, this is an ever evolving landscape, so the position could well change. At the moment, however, it's clear that tensions are beginning to rise with a bit of a squeeze being felt by landlords in terms of tenants on the one side and other parties such as lenders on the other. 
This can particularly be seen in terms of the moratorium on termination in the case of non-payment of rent. This protection, which I briefly mentioned earlier, and which Claire will go into later, is intended to provide relief to businesses that are struggling to pay bills because of the impact of COVID. However, it is being voiced by some landlords that certain tenants are using the legislation as effectively a license not to pay rent. So the arguments coming from landlords seem to be more that of moral arguments. For example, those businesses which are well capitalized or those which remain open and trading due to their classification as an essential business. There are actually various examples of essential businesses which have continued to trade throughout the lockdown and have refused to pay rent. And these businesses will also be benefiting from the government's decision to scrap business rates for the rest of the year. As a result, many landlords are calling upon the government to act upon this so that tenants who can pay do pay, with landlords reminding the government that many of them have borrowed to buy their properties and rely on the revenue from tenants to pay back their loans. And some landlords have gone as far as saying that if they cannot pay back their loans as a result, the financial burden could end up on the shoulders of the country's banks. The government does appear to be somewhat recognising that some landlords may have been given a bit of a raw deal, with talk of conference calls between the British Property Federation and Treasury Ministers last week to discuss a deal that could include a grant scheme to cover some rent bills and a waiving of a tax on landlords with empty properties. However, for now, it seems that we'll just have to watch this space to see how commercial landlords will fare in the long term. And we will no doubt provide updates and blogs if there are any changes. So on that note, I'll pass you on to my colleague Claire, who will discuss the issue arising in the property litigation arena as a result of COVID. Thanks, Jane. So I am going to give you a fairly brief overview of the impacts that some of the measures brought in by the UK and Scottish governments in response to coronavirus are having on the typical sorts of landlords and tenant disputes that we deal with, such as recovery of unpaid rent and innocency of leases. I'll also run through some of the practicalities that we have to take into account at the moment around operation of the courts generally and methods of service of court papers or lease notices, for example. Moving on to my first slide. As a starting point, in response to the coronavirus lockdown, the Scottish courts restricted their business to deal with set categories of urgent business only. This broadly covers family actions in respect of the likes of child custody and protection, applications for interim interdicts and cases facing potential time bar issues. Generally, all other existing non-urgent cases have been effectively put on hold by the courts and there are limited types of new actions that can be raised at the moment. This means that landlords will have to satisfy the court that there is a particular urgency requiring any new payment actions or removal actions to be raised now. Perhaps the most obvious reason being that the landlord might lose the right to recover any sums that are coming up for five years overdue through prescription. The latest guidance issued by the courts at the end of April indicated that a return to business as usual isn't quite possible yet. However, some measures are now being introduced to try and progress cases, which may have been put on hold as non-urgent business. For instance, some appeal hearings are now being heard um, virtually in the inner court of the court session, inner house of the court session. And for sheriff court actions, there's now an application process by which certain types of existing action can now be restarted. There's a good reason to do so and the action can be progressed remotely without needing a hearing on evidence. So overall, we're starting to see a bit of movement towards a return to normality, but it's unlikely that at the moment any new actions will be processed by the court in quite the same way. So moving on to my next slide, what does the restricted operation of the courts mean in practice for real estate matters? Obviously, the first issue that's likely to be at the forefront of landlords' minds is rent recovery especially as we're fast approaching the Scottish May quarter payment date. As I mentioned, new actions are generally not being treated as urgent unless they could be time barred, although existing actions might now start to be progressed if they can. But another impact of the court's restricted operation is that service by sheriff officers has also been curtailed. 
guidance was issued by the professional association for sheriff officers that has resulted in most sheriff officer firms temporarily suspending normal business with the exception of um, service of essential court documents for urgent cases. And where this impacts real estate clients is not only in relation to the normal debt recovery work that we will undertake, such as service of charges for payments for unpaid rents, um, or instructing bank arrestments or goods attachments, all of which are carried out by sheriff officers, but may also impact the service of certain lease notices. For example, tenants or landlords might wish to serve break notices or notices to quit or perhaps even schedules of dilapidations by a sheriff officer if there's any doubt as to whether postal service will be successful if premises are closed at the moment. And we found that there are still some firms of sheriff officers that are able to serve these notices if we can demonstrate that they're urgent. For example, if there's a deadline for service, the break notice is coming up. And moving on to my next slide, where does this leave landlords with debt recovery? At the moment, there's no direct prohibition on landlords taking action to recover rents. But the reality is that the usual types of diligence carried out by sheriff officers restricted, as are the courts, so there may be some practical difficulties to overcome. One particular example that you might have seen um, is that the UK government has introduced or announced towards the end of April that it intends to ban the use of statutory demands and winding up petitions until the 30th of June this year. This is one of the measures that they plan to introduce to protect the UK High Street from what the government is describing as aggressive rent collection. The general approach seems to be aiming to achieve a sense of cooperation between commercial landlords and tenants to avoid widespread store closure by giving tenants a little bit of breathing space. It is important to note that none of the government measures necessarily entitle commercial tenants to a rent reduction or holiday as some of the tenants are requesting. They really put a temporary pause on landlords taking the usual types of enforcement action to try and encourage discussions to take place but the obligation to pay in full still stands. Some of the things we're seeing landlords do though is um, agree to a rent deferral or perhaps a move from quarterly to monthly rent payments if that would help their tenants cash flow. So back to statutory demands, for those of you who don't know, these are a formal demand for payment which allows creditors to petition the court to liquidate companies or to bankrupt individuals if payment isn't made within three weeks of service and if the debt isn't disputed. We're yet to see exactly what the proposed restrictions on statutory demands will cover as it's not yet law and hasn't been confirmed yet whether the proposals will also apply to Scotland. But the UK government has indicated that their ban on the use of stat demands will be backdated to those served from the 1st of March onwards essentially avoiding any such demands that have been served before the ban is um, put in place. And if a liquidation or sequestration petition is presented to the court based on an expired statutory demands, the court will now have to carry out a preliminary assessment to establish whether or not the tenant's reason for non-payment is related to coronavirus. So that leaves um, potentially open to raise a petition to wind up or sequestrate a tenant um, who have a long or has a long history of non-payment which can't solely be attributed to the current trading conditions and um, so all is not lost. Moving on to my next slide, one of the points that Jane mentioned earlier was the tenant protection measure that's been brought in relating to irritancy of leases, either by a failure to non, not pay um, any sums due or a breach of any other tenant obligations, um, which we call the process of irritancy. In England, a temporary three-month ban has been put on the use of forfeiture, which is their equivalent process, although there's quite a few differences, um, which is implemented by the Coronavirus Act. 2020 and the three month ban expires on the 30th of June, although that date can be amended as necessary. Scottish Government has followed suit by extending the statutory 
notice period under the Scottish legislation governing evidency, which is the 1985 Act referred to on my slides. Um, and the notice period ex has been extended from 14 days to 14 weeks, which is quite a substantial jump. The government can also choose to extend that 14 week period notice again if necessary. This obviously gives tenants a lot more breathing space if they want to keep their premises um, open and if they're able to pay to do so, even if they need a little bit longer because of any cash flow issues. Ultimately though, if I'm asked whether um, it's still worth serving a pre since warning notice at the moment, I would say the answer to that is yes, because it still starts the clock running in terms of the landlord being entitled to recover possession if the tenant doesn't pay. So from a landlord perspective, although matters might be just delayed slightly, there's still certainly a benefit in serving a pre-urgency warning notice, which might perhaps bring tenants to the negotiating table and um, even if a suitable agreement can't be reached, the landlord can terminate the lease after expiry of the 14 weeks. Just notice that there's a raised hand, but we'll deal with any questions um, towards the end, so we'll come back to you. If you could move on to my next slide. The 14 week notice period only applies to monetary breaches of the lease. So any issues with non-payment of rent or service charge, but lease innocency clauses usually also allow termination in other circumstances. Innocency on the back of any other breach of the lease is governed by section five of the 1985 Act, which qualifies termination by considering if, in all the circumstances of the case, a fair and reasonable landlord would terminate the lease. And if there's a breach that's capable of being remedied, reasonable notice has to be given to the tenant to remedy the breach before termination. What is reasonable notice will depend on the nature of the breach itself, um, and it's likely that a court would find that a fair and reasonable landlord will still have to consider the impact of coronavirus on its tenants and their ability to remedy any breaches at the moment. The final issue that I am going to discuss on the next slide is in relation to whether keep open clauses can still be enforced by landlords at the moment. So usually if a lease contains a clear and sufficiently worded keep open clause, the landlords can obtain a court order forcing a tenant who is at risk of closing shop before lease expiry to stay open. For the majority of tenants operating a non-essential business, which has been forced to close, it's unlikely that keep open clauses can be enforced at the moment, and this is because most commercial leases will have a statutory compliance clause stating that the tenant is required to comply with all governmental statutes, orders, regulations, and so on. And in the current circumstances where the government has ordered the closure of all non-essential businesses, it's difficult to see how a landlord could possibly argue that the keep open clause should take precedence over tenant statutory compliance. For those tenants operating essential businesses, landlords would have to overcome a two-stage test to enforce a keep open clause. Firstly, there has to be a clear obligation in the lease, which will depend on the wording of the individual lease. And secondly, the court would look at who the balance of convenience favours. Given the requirements that any essential business um, which is remaining open has to implement social distancing measures, it's possible that the balance of convenience would favour um, any tenants who could show that social distancing couldn't be properly implemented on their premises or that perhaps remaining open would pose too high a risk for the health and safety of their staff or customers, which would probably help them justify closure. So that was a fairly high level run through um, some of the litigation issues that we are dealing with and I'm now going to pass you over to Harriet who will give you an update from a construction perspective. Great, thanks Claire. Um, so the current pandemic has had a significant impact on the construction industry and that looks likely to continue for some time to come. Um, our construction team at Brodie's have been advising on nothing else but really COVID related project issues over the last few weeks. So questions such as should contractors be on site? What relief events apply under commonly used standard form contracts? And do parties need to do anything to document what is commercially agreed? So I'm going to briefly touch upon these topics today. 
So the first slide looks at the current legal position in both England and Scotland. Now, the message from the UK government has been that construction sites should continue to operate but must implement site operating procedures, which have been developed by Build UK and published by the Construction Leadership Council. Where it is not possible to follow social distancing guidelines in full in relation to a particular activity, consideration should be given as to whether that activity needs to continue for the site to continue to operate, and if so, all mitigating actions possible should be taken to reduce the risk of the spread of the virus. So there's been nothing in legislation requiring construction sites to close, and most of our contractor clients have kept the majority of their sites open in England, even when they're not operating at full capacity, and some are as low as 50 or 60% capacity. Now, the Prime Minister's address on Sunday evening highlighted the UK government's concern for the country's economic well-being and in response there's greater emphasis um, on getting individuals back to work where possible. But I think it's safe to say that Sunday's address and also um, yesterday's or last night's press conference has been met with heavy criticism um, and many have accused the UK government of giving unclear, unrealistic and impractical guidance. So individuals are being encouraged to return to work when they're unable to work at home and when they're able to do so safely and in accordance with social distancing. And the construction industry was used as a specific example. And yesterday, the UK government issued guidance for employers to help them get their businesses back up and running and their workplaces operating safely. So I think we'll just need to wait and see how things pan out, but it will be interesting to see how the construction industry in England reacts. So next, looking to the position in Scotland, the Scottish Government are taking a different but arguably less confusing stance than the UK Government. And when it comes to guidance, and it's important to remember that guidance is just that, and it's not the same as legislation or regulations. And on the 25th of March, the Scottish Government published guidance for businesses and social distancing. And in that guidance, the Scottish Government essentially stated that all businesses and sites should close unless essential to the health and welfare of the country. And then on the 6th of April, the Scottish Government published further guidance stating that premises and sites should close unless works are capable of being carried out in a way that is fully consistent with established social distancing advice. So the position in guidance is that if works are for non-essential purposes, then sites should close. But again, it's important to remember that it is simply guidance and it's not a mandatory requirement of law. So looking next at the legislation position, so on the 26th of March, the health protection regulations came into force and imposed various restrictions. Now these regulations do have the force of law and initially only required certain listed premises to implement social distancing. So for example, shops and post offices, and there was no direct application at that time to construction sites. But on the 21st of April, the Scottish Government made a key amendment to the scope of the regulations and the regulations now apply to all persons carrying on a business or providing a service. So this can therefore include construction related businesses and construction related services. So while, while sites can still legally open, social distancing applies directly to the construction sector and it can be enforced by the police through the powers made available under the regulations and we have seen instances where that has happened. Moving on to the next slide, I have a look at what the standard form con construction contracts say and what reliefs are available to contractors. And I've set out here what we've seen many contractors rely upon in their notices for delay over recent weeks. And looking to SBCC and JCT contracts in particular, because these are very commonly used on development projects and also relevant events in particular, and these are the grounds for claiming additional time under these contracts. The most frequently referenced relevant events are employer instructions under clause 3.10, um, which is postponement of work. So this is typically referred to where there's been an instruction of any sort from the employer for the contractor to get off the site. Next, we've got any impediment, prevention or default, whether by act or omission by the employer. So for example, if the site's been shut by the employer and the contractor's unable to access it. Next, we've got the exercise after the base date by the UK government of a statutory power, which directly affects the execution of the works. And this is commonly referred to as the change in law event. Now, in Scotland, this has been referenced since the 25th of March, but as I mentioned, there was no legislation enacted at that time which stated that construction sites were to close. It was purely guidance. And moving on to the last and probably the most frequently referenced relevant event, and that's force majeure. Now, the term is not defined under SBCC and JCT contracts, but force majeure is essentially an event beyond the control of the parties, which could not have been anticipated. And we believe that COVID-19 quite clearly fits comfortably in this ground. 
but it's also important to check whether the force majeure has not been defined by any schedule of amendments which accompanies a bill contract. It could be that the term has been amended quite narrowly, meaning COVID-19 no longer fits within it. So it's always important to check that you've got your standard form bill contract and you've got your amendments that sit alongside that. So you need to make sure there's no changes made. Next, I've noted the relevant matters, and these are the grounds for claiming loss and expense under the contract. So that's dealt with differently and separately from claims for additional time. Now, the grounds for claiming loss and expense are much more limited than the grounds for claiming additional time. So the relevant matters that we've seen referenced include, again, employer instructions for the postponement of work, and secondly, any impediment or prevention by the employer. So as I said, when the employer doesn't let the contractor go onto site, for example. It's probably important to also outline what we see as being the market position at the moment under these contracts. Now, notwithstanding the particular terms of contracts, we are seeing public and private sector bodies being more generous when it comes to awarding additional time, although it's not necessarily clear at this stage how much time will be awarded under contracts. Lesser meeting additional costs, but even when there is no contractual entitlement, some developers are still agreeing to reasonable prelim costs for additional time on site. So I think it's clear to see there's definitely been a genuine appetite to support the supply chain and to make sure the construction industry does emerge from the pandemic with as few casualties as possible. And moving on to my last slide and the last point I want to mention very quickly is just in relation to documenting what has been agreed between parties where projects are ongoing. So where a bill contract has already been entered into, parties have to consider the extent to which any amendments are required to the terms to reflect the commercial agreements that have been made. So for example, amendments may include things like extension to completion dates, changes to the contract sum, or even changes to the method or means in which works are being carried out. So once the parties are in agreement on such amendments, these should be clearly set out in writing by way of a formal supplemental agreement to the original bill contract, and that should then be executed by all parties. We strongly advise against agreeing key amendments informally, such as by way of email. The purpose really of the formal agreement is just to make sure there's no scope for either party to unpick the terms at a later point in time. So this is something we're helping a lot of developer and contractor clients with at the moment, but I suspect we will be helping a lot more once parties have a better understanding of when construction sites um, are going to fully reopen and when there can be a full assessment as to the additional time required and the additional loss and expense required. Um, so that was everything I was going to cover on the construction side. So I'm going to pass back to Kirsty and I think we're going to work through maybe some of the questions that have been raised uh, during the course of the webinar. Yeah, thanks Harriet. Um, hopefully that's been a useful run through of quite a few COVID related property, property litigation and construction topics for you. Um, you'll do appreciate from what we've covered that it is a very fast changing landscape at the moment. So there's plenty to try to keep up to date with. Um, there are lots of resources available on the Brodie's website, which has a dedicated COVID-19 hub. Um, so do have a look at that if you are interested. Um, conscious of time, so let's have a look at some of the questions which have come in. Feel free um, to add any further questions into the Q&A box in the menu bar at the bottom of your screens just now as well. Um, so I will take the first question, um, which is, what will the requirements be for businesses when they are allowed to be open following lockdown? Um, I suppose that's that's a good question um, and there's not not really a particular answer at the moment. Um, unfortunately, it's not something anyone knows the answer to at the moment. Um, and I know that sounds like a bit of a get out. Um, the government needs to review the current regulations at least every three weeks. Um, so only when they do that and update guidance will businesses get a clearer idea as to when they can open and when they do and um, what measures. Um, they'll be expected to take. Um, from what the government's said, they are looking at that at the moment. They are um, liaising with um, industries to try to work out the best way forward for them when, when they do get back up and running. Um, and a lot of businesses themselves, I think, are, are taking steps to look at business continuity measures kind of um, a bit blind at the moment, not knowing what the government are going to say, but certainly um, pulling together plans um, as to what steps they might have to take um, when they reopen. Um, so I'm sorry it's not um, more of a solid answer, um, but we'll just have to wait and see, I think, on that one. Um, Claire, do you want to um, pick up one of the property litigation questions? Sure. So I mentioned the term rent holiday, and I have been asked um, 
about that because it seems to be causing a bit of confusion as to whether this means a uh, rent deferment where the tenant pays at a later date um, or an agreement that the rent will be zero and not payable at all later. And I think it really depends on the discussions that are taking place, but a lot of tenants will be using the term rent holiday as meaning a break from paying rent and you know, not having to pay that um, at a later date. So I think it is important if there is any confusion um, just to be really clear in any negotiations that you're having, whether on behalf of a tenant or landlords, what is being meant by rent holiday and um, have quite detailed provisions in place as to when and how much um, payment is going to be made later or if it's not going to be made at all, if there's like a short rent free period that's been agreed. Great, thanks. Um, just to get a good mix of questions, Harriet, do you want to pick up one of the construction ones? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one of the questions is how long is it likely to take for construction sites to reopen and for normality to be resumed? Um, now there's really not going to be a set period of time, unfortunately, and I think how long it is going to take is really going to depend upon particular projects. Um, but there are various factors that contractors and developers do need to consider and that will have a bearing on how quickly normality can be resumed. Um, so probably first thing most crucially is what does the current guidance and legislation say at that point in time because we, we do know that changes frequently and um, so what restrictions are imposed and how practical are these going to be to follow contractors also need to consider things like health and safety concerns and make sure that they're implementing clear policies and procedures on site and um, for their workers to follow also things like can sufficient PPE be sourced but again we know that's been a particular issue in terms of, of sourcing PPE and um, so that's something else that contractors will need to consider before they put their their workers back on site and again it's looking further down the supply chain um, are subcontractors and uh, suppliers going to be also um, resuming their businesses and able to, to perform their works and services um, because if they're not back up and running or there's going to be specific lead-in times for getting products and materials that will have an impact on the project resuming so as I say, there's no set period of time, unfortunately, it all very much depends upon the answers to those questions and the answers to those questions will depend upon the point of time um, at which construction sites are allowed to reopen um, and the particular project in question. Great, thanks Harriet. Um, I think we've maybe got time for one more question, conscious of time. Um, Jane, do you want to pick up one of the other property questions that have been asked? Yeah. Um... So I think one of the questions that's been asked, which is relevant to what I discussed, someone has asked what I meant when I said a lease re-gear. Um, this is essentially just another way of saying a lease variation. So changing the terms in a lease, and it could relate to any terms. It could be the length or term of a lease, the amount of rent payable, or the rent review mechanism, just as a few examples. Um, it's important that the changes must be agreed between the parties and then must be formally documented. And this is what we refer to as a minute of variation, which records the changes made to the lease. And both parties will then sign this document and it will get registered. Um, myself and Kirsty deal with these documents a lot. They cross our desks on a regular basis. So if you ever have any questions about these, feel free to get in touch with us and we'll be happy to help. Great, thanks Jane. Um, conscious of time, I think we'll probably stop there um, and sign off. Um, if there's some questions that you've asked that we haven't got to, then we will follow up. If you've left your name against them in the Q&A box, um, we'll follow up with you after um, today's session. Um, just goes to say thank you um, for all of you uh, joining us today. Um, we hope you will join us again for another Brodie's Academy event soon. <laughs>